All right. So, a couple things off the top before we jump into the material today. First of all, in the last class, we weren't able to get Top Hat working for everyone. Um, a couple things to try. First of all, getting logged on kind of early before we start using those questions. So, doing that maybe now. Also, uh, I think your most devices default to the wireless edge roam. Uh, and it appears as though maybe IU Guest actually is a little bit faster and a little bit more reliable because edge roam is the default. Everybody on the university tends to be on it, and so it's a little bit slower. So if it's still kind of having loading problems, try to switch your Wi-Fi from that edge roam to IU Guest and see if that, that kind of helps. Okay? So get that going, even as, as I'm talking, if you want to. Um, I will get up, so the practice problem's already on Canvas for this next week's quiz. I'll get up an answer key after class later this afternoon when I get back to my office. So you'll know what the answers are, but those PL sessions also start tonight. They're going to work through those problems with a written out solution guide that I give. Them, right? So there's a lot of additional information that you can get from going to those CL sessions that I'm never going to post. Right? There's trying to create some incentives to attend those CL sessions because I know how beneficial they can be. Um, another thing related to the Wi-Fi that I forgot, I was told by the IT department, maybe sometimes just going to settings and clearing your cache and cookies, cache and cookies, whatever, whatever you said. Yeah. I don't. I was just saying, I think there's a way that you can clear one without clearing the other. Yeah. Um, but even if it's just clearing kind of the cookies, I don't think. Maybe a good workaround, choose a browser that you don't use, download Firefox or something like that. That way you don't have to worry about stored passwords and whatever you're kind of, if you, you know, if you have a Mac, probably use Safari or Google Chrome a lot. Get one of these other kind of free web browsers and then just rely on that one. So you don't have to worry about getting rid of your passwords. Might be um, my office hours, I think I mentioned, since we had um, Labor Day this week, we didn't have Monday office hours. So I'll, instead of moving them to tomorrow to be 1230 or 330, I had some meetings pop up because that's usually what my Fridays are reserved for. Uh, I will be in my office, so still from 10 to 1 tomorrow. So if you do want to stop by, if you're having any kind of questions, feel free to stop by tomorrow from 10 to 1. I saw a hand up there, yeah. Did you switch it from, yeah? Okay. Okay, let's just give it some time. I'm not using the questions right away, so we'll see hopefully in the next 10, 15 minutes, you know, as long as you have the process going. If not, I'm going to have to, I don't know, come up with a, a solution, which may be just not using Top Hat, and I end up using Canvas to create all my quizzes there, which is going to be a headache. But if we can't get the Wi-Fi working, I'll come up with some additional solutions from this after this week. Yeah. Yep. All right. Go to files. Go to module two. Got this folder that says week two practice problems. Yep. And if well, if you look here, they should be. Oh, I forgot to add it here. Well, let's just do it right now. <laughs> yeah, so they always, I sometimes will add them because I have to add them to the files first before I move to the modules. So I, I apologize for that. But yeah, they should be able to find them there on Canvas now. Okay. Final thing I wanted to mention, I had only really one issue with this, but it's just something that moving forward, I don't want to have to keep dealing with. I don't accept any late quizzes. So what this also means is it doesn't mean start the quiz before 1159. It means that it needs to be submitted, right? So that means if you want the full 60 minutes, what do you need to start the quiz by? It's not hard math, 1059, right? So it doesn't accept any late quizzes. That doesn't mean starting it before 1159. That means starting and completing it before 1159, okay? Um, other than that, any questions for me before we jump into material here? Also, can everybody hear me in the back okay? Am I talking loud enough? Right. I, I'll use the microphone if I have to, but I know like if I cough or something, then it's really not fun to listen to. Uh, so I like to not rely on it, but if I start to kind of, my voice goes throughout the semester, please let me know if you guys can't ever hear me in the back, okay? All right, so we left off. Yeah. <clears throat> Good question. So... I also dropped on files. There should be the CL days, locations, and times. So it kind of has it all set out each time slot, what the three locations are. I also, and I was going to do this at the end, but since we're here, I'll just do it now. I also put up the CL student assignments post. Don't worry about the post part. I had to create something I didn't want you guys to see. It's probably going to take a while to load. 
But basically, it's kind of this sort of why I have a bunch of different tabs that has all the different days and times and then some of the students and what room location you're assigned to. There's then a full list that's sortable, so it might be easy to kind of sort that by name and then look for your name to be able to figure out where your assigned day, time, and location is. Okay? Now, just because I have those assignments, honestly, if you don't want to pay attention to them, don't. The, the classrooms are usually never full. It's just more of a way for me to say there is a guaranteed spot, and I got almost all, probably 90 plus percent of you in that first initial preferred. If it wasn't in the first, I got all of you in the second. So if you want to take a look at that and see what your assigned day kind of time where you have a guaranteed seat, you can look at this CL assignments post file. But in practice, really, you can attend whatever CL session you want to this week, and there should be plenty of available room. This file, once again, kind of lets you know where those room locations are at the various times. Yeah. Thursday and Sunday, they do the, they do the exact same thing. So if you attend, if you attend one of the CL sessions, you're going to see what every other C. Well, I mean, you have a different instructor, but you'll see essentially the same thing. Yep. Yeah. So I might have mentioned this. If not, some of you maybe have add, added late. When you show up, you're just going to write your name down, right? They're going to have a sheet of paper. They're going to verify that you're writing one name down. <laughs> so I guess if you want to write a friend's name down and not yours, that's up to you. But you're writing one name down, right? You're writing your name down, and then they'll input that into a full a shared file that I have to keep attract the attendance throughout the semester. Yep. Any other questions before we jump into this here? If you want to, I mean, it's, it's going to be the same problems. So it may not, you know, the marginal benefit of the first one you go to is going to be a lot higher than the marginal benefit of the second. But there probably is some still positive marginal benefit. You know, it just may be a lot closer to zero because uh, you've already seen the problems work through. Yep. Any other questions before we get going here? Okay. All right. It was a good question. I'm glad, glad you asked. So let's dive into material here. We left off last class thinking about this idea. Of we had this production possibility curve. We're keeping it simple, just two goods right now. And I could choose some combination of those two goods. Any point on my curve we said was production efficient. I'm using all of my resources. I'm producing as much as possible given my resource constraint. But what point is allocative efficient? That is where we said, well, look, Every combination I choose, there's going to be some marginal costs and marginal benefits to producing that amount of the good. Right? So just to kind of revisit it, and I believe we drew this out on Tuesday. I shouldn't say things like I believe. I know we did this on Tuesday. So we said, okay, if I have these two different goods, X and Y, I can think about, and here it's maybe easier to think about this as a dollar amount. You really could put this, what the cost was in terms of the other good, but just for the intuition, we'll think about this as like the dollar value that you would put to the different levels of this, this or the different quantities of this that you're producing. And I guess to be complete, you'd see there's zeros. So initially we said this production possibilities curve, the slope tells us what? The marginal cost of one more of the x-axis good, right? So initially this slope is pretty flat. That means the value is going to be relatively small or low, right? So we're going to start out with pretty low marginal costs, but as we produce more and more, what's happening to our slope? It's getting steeper and steeper, or it's becoming a larger. Now notice it's downward sloping, so it's always negative, but it's going to be a larger negative value. So essentially, I had people stop my office yesterday. This is the way I explained it. I think this is a good way. The slope will always be negative. When we're talking about costs, because I'm saying costs, inherently we know that's negative. You wouldn't tell me I went to Chipotle and spent uh, negative, it cost me negative 10, right? It cost you $10, right? So when we're saying this is the cost, it's inherent that it's a negative value. We know there's always gonna be a trade-off, so we know the slope is always negative here of our production possibilities curves. So as we produce more and more, our marginal cost is increasing, where we end up with something like this. Here, we also talked about last class, as I consume more of something, to the point of the CL session. Each one I consume has less and less benefit to me, right? Less and less additional benefit. So we've got decreasing marginal benefits, increasing marginal costs. Based off last week, we said we will choose to do something as long as that marginal benefit is greater than or equal to that marginal cost. So we stop right at that point where those two lines intersect because there's, that's where the marginal benefit is exactly equal to the marginal cost. Any point on my production possibilities curve is production efficient? 
But if I was choosing this point, notice what's true about the marginal benefit relative to the marginal cost at that chosen quantity of X. I actually have like a net negative benefit. Yeah, my marginal benefit is below my marginal cost. It's costing me more additional money than it is I'm getting additional benefit. Why would I do that? So we should be, even though this is a production efficient point, I'd actually want to reduce how much I'm producing of good X because I want to get to this point where the marginal benefit is exactly equal to the marginal benefit. Sorry, marginal cost is exactly equal to the marginal benefit. So there will be one point on that production possibilities curve that is allocated efficient. Okay? All the points are production efficient, but only one of them is allocatively efficient. Okay. Now, why do we know that the allocated efficient point has to be on this curve? Why couldn't this be the allocated? Well, here, why couldn't this be the allocated efficient point? Yeah, the marginal benefit and the marginal cost are equal at that point, but I'm not using all of my resources. So I know that if I used all my resources, I could get even more benefit for my society or for my economy, right? So we know that the allocated efficient point will always be a production efficient point. Now, why can't I choose this point? I don't have enough resources, right? So we're going to talk about things here in a second where, well, how can I get out to that point? Even if I've got kind of the same slopes and the marginal benefits and marginal costs are still the same, I want to be able to shift this production possibilities curve out. And we'll talk about some ways we can do that. Here they go hand in hand, right? Because we're only talking about two goods. So inherently, to use my resources to produce one thing, I have to give up producing the other good. We started to add more goods when we try to kind of put like a total dollar amount to it. And there, you know, it is the opportunity cost of basically what we're not doing with our resources. So these two terms in this module kind of go hand in hand. Yep. The other questions on this is kind of, like I said, I know we kind of ended with this, but I wanted to do kind of a more complete review before we dove in a little bit deeper. So I left that slide open for me to do that, which is we said, okay, I want to get to these points that are unattainable, right? I don't have enough resources. How can I get more resources? Well, we don't necessarily actually need more resources. We might have things like technology changes, right? So we'll take a look at Packback later on today, just so I can kind of show you how it works. And the first one will be assigned after class. In fact, I think if you go to Packback right now, I had it set to release at eight, so it should show up now. Um, but if we think about something like chat GPT, right? My wife's an assistant principal right now, and like, she probably wouldn't love me telling people this, but like for like mundane tasks where she needs like just to look at something quick, she uses chat GPT all the time. She'll use it for, I mean, even not for work, she'll use it for recipes, she'll use it for everything, right? She's way more efficient with chat GPT, right? This technology change, she has the same amount of resources, same amount of hours in a day, but she now can do more with this additional piece of technology. So how can we, you, we have the same resources, we don't have, we have the same number of people, same number of raw materials. If we come up with a technology change that makes those even raw materials more efficient, we find ways to burn uh, oil, you know, more efficiently, right? Then we can get, um, here, I'll jump the gun a bit, this kind of shift out in our production possibilities curve. Well, why do we like this? Well, because now we could even get more of bulk goods, right? Having more of both goods, we're definitely going to be better off, right? So uh, some other things that can cause this population growth, right? The easiest way to think about this is one of our main resources is labor hours. If I just have more laborers, <laughs> I've got more labor hours, right? Now, I guess technically, if we want to think about population growth, we're assuming that the same percent of the population is working, right? If some people aren't working our economy, that, that's not going to have an influence. But in general, right, population growth. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of hard to get away without working. I mean, you can do it. There's a lot of people in Bloomington that you see walking around that clearly aren't part of the labor force. But, you know, it, it's a small percentage, right? So the more people we have, the more people, or the, sorry, the more people we should have working, more labor hours kind of shifts our production possibilities curve outward. And that was probably an off-colored comment. But anyway, so changes in productivity. This is the idea of, you know, maybe this is generally caused by technology change. Um, but, it, you know, they kind of go hand in hand, but we're going to talk about something where we can get changes in productivity by the amount of money we're investing into what we call capital. So the amount of money we're investing even to something like education, 
right? Every single one of you, hopefully after this class and after you leave this university are gonna be more productive in whatever role, whatever job you take, right? So kind of change in productivity, we might make investments. You're making an investment into human capital, right? Your, your skills, your, your brain, your, your, your knowledge, but we can make investments into like, you know, physical capital as well, okay? Like uh, machinery, things like that. All right, so hopefully that's not, not too wild, right? We have more resources. And the easy way to think about this is, if I have more people or I have this technology change that impacts both goods the same, well, if I'm only producing that good, I can now get more of it. Or if I'm only producing the other good, I can now get more of it. And then any combination in between, I should be able to kind of get to these higher points that used to be unattainable, no longer are, okay? Questions on that, okay? Then the same thing <clears throat> applies when I'm making decisions based off of my new production possibilities curve, Every point now on there is production efficient, but there's still only going to be one allocated efficient point. Okay. All right. Um, what else did I want to say here? So let's say we have two goods, iPhones and wheat, right? Change this up a little bit. We have some technology advancement. I don't know. Let's say it's, uh, and maybe it's not even an advancement. Maybe we just uh, discover some more cobalt mines, right? And so we're able to produce these uh, technology goods and microchips and things um, much more efficiently, or we just have more resources to produce them. Well, finding these new cobalt mines, what does that do to my ability to produce wheat? As far as I know, nothing, right? So we have this technology change, or we have this like new resource discovered that only impacts one of our goods. So this new technology change or, or whatever it is might increase if I'm only producing iPhones and I have all this new cobalt, maybe I can produce more iPhones now, but having this new resource of cobalt doesn't really impact how much wheat I can produce at all. So if you have a technology change that only impacts one good, then you're gonna not get this nice shift out, like a, what we would call like a parallel shift. You're actually gonna have just one of the intercept values change. And notice what's now happening to the slope, try to draw this visual nice, at every single quantity of wheat now, What's happened to the cost? Yeah, it might be hard to see, but right, this is a little bit flatter than this. So the steeper the slope, higher the cost, right? So whenever we have a technology that impacts only one good, it makes producing the other good now more costly. And that, that kind of makes sense, right? Because if I now have this new technology to produce this other good, well, then when I stop producing it, right, to produce the X good, well, now I'm gonna have to give up way more. Right? So that cost of producing my x-axis good at every point has now become larger, okay? Any questions on, on this idea? All right, let me see here. Um, I already mentioned this. We've got a higher marginal cost. I'm going to show you something similar, but just slightly different. Maybe, there we go. And this is all... I know it's kind of pushed to the right, but it's because I'm getting some weird shadows here. So if you, you have any issues, see anything, let me know. So let's say instead, um, I don't know, here, we'll keep running with this example. Let's say um, some scientist in the, I don't know, biology building here comes up with uh, some new uh, pesticide for crops that allows you, when you're harvesting the same field, more of the crops will be good. And so there's like this technology change that impacts the amount of wheat we can, we can produce in our economy. But how do pesticides impact the quantity of iPhones we can produce? Like I said, maybe there's a connection I'm not thinking of, but I would think not at all, right? So we might initially start out with a production possibilities curve that looks something like this. We now have, I should have, so here is the amount of iPhones we could produce before using all our resources. Here is the total amount if we were only producing wheat, how much we could produce. But we have now had this technology change, this new pesticide that says, if you're only producing wheat, I can now produce a larger amount. But this pesticide doesn't have any impact if I'm only producing iPhones because how do pesticides impact iPhone production, right? So looks something like this. So you can see a shift on either axis, right? Just depends on which good kind of change. We want to think about it this way. If I had this kind of a shift, I try to like look at my slopes here. 
at the exact same quantity. I tried to draw this to scale, but notice what's happening to my slope it's becoming a little bit flatter. So when I have a technology improvement and my X axis good, what happens to the cost of that X axis good at every point? It's flatter, it's cheaper, it's lower, right? So anytime we come up with a technology that improves the production of a certain good, it becomes less costly to produce more of that good. Once again, you know, I think it's kind of intuitive, right? If we have a technology change that makes us more productive at producing something, that's the thing that we should be wanting to produce, right? It's lowering the cost to produce that. We're going to want to produce more of it. In fact, I won't push you this far in the quiz, but it might be kind of interesting since we're here to think about this. So this initial production possibilities curve, well, let's just do our um, decreasing marginal benefits. Let's say those don't change at all, consuming wheat. Our people have the same same benefit. Before there would have been some marginal cost, right? so we could have said, you know, I don't know. Oh, here, there we go. Maybe here was the allocated efficient point before. Now, if I think about my new cost at every single point, they're going to be what? I'm going to draw this a little bit exaggerated just to prove the point, but they should be. lower, right? My marginal cost, we said, because this curve is getting flatter at every point, are going to be a little bit lower. Now, they're still increasing, right? As I produce more wheat, the cost of what I'm giving up, how many iPhones I'm giving up is increasing larger and larger. But now notice, where would my optimal point be here? Well, now the allocated efficient point for that good that I had that technology change for is going to actually be actually the allocated efficient point on producing a little bit more of that good. Okay. So technology changes in a good will cause societies to kind of shift their production towards that good. And it directly comes from the fact that it's lowering the marginal costs, which is always going to push out that optimal allocated efficient quantity for society. Okay. Like I said, I probably won't push you quite this far, like on the quiz or something. Um, I'll just kind of want you to know how you can kind of make these changes on the production possibilities curve. But here would be the allocated efficient um, uh, changes that result from those, those shifts. Okay. Any questions on this before we continue? Yeah. Uh, in this equation, when you're talking about the groups, hmm? there's going to be the same population for the original allocated efficiency for what you mentioned. Like, it's usually more groups because you really don't need to eat it. In this case, why would they be okay giving up for? Oh, yeah, so it's not, yeah, so here it's because people decide before they didn't want to eat it, not because there was zero marginal benefit, but it was because the marginal benefit was below the marginal cost. For all of these units now, notice with my new cost, what's true? The marginal benefit is now greater than the marginal cost. So we consume things based off of the relationship of marginal benefits to marginal cost. So even though that, yes, as we consume more wheat, that marginal benefit is definitely getting closer and closer to zero. And maybe it's a much steeper slope than I, I drew, right? But anytime you lower the cost to something, you're automatically going to get the optimal or allocated efficient point is going to be that you want to consume a little bit more of that. Because it's always going to push those costs to now where you have new quantities, where now the marginal benefit is above the marginal cost, and it wasn't before. Is that what you're going to Uh, you couldn't quite do the same thing with the shift in the y-axis because notice I'm mapping out there it would look different because I am mapping out the cost of the x-axis good and we said when I saw a shift in the y-axis at every point it actually became steeper so what was happening to my marginal cost there yeah if it's steeper that meant I was having a higher cost so let's say I did have a technology change that shifted that up like that. What I would actually have is higher marginal cost, which would say, okay, I should actually be consuming less wheat. Because it wasn't a technology change for wheat production in that case, it would have been a technology change in iPhones. In which case that makes sense. Whatever good has a technology change, I will end up producing more of that and less of the one that did. 
Yeah. 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 So you could start in the same place, but you're right. Technically, I probably should have drew, drew both of these so that they had some intercept, right? Because that very first cost is going to be something positive. So you're right. I'm drawing this more to kind of, like I said, I'm going to draw it exaggerated to really get at this point that it's shifting just the quantity to the right. But you're right. When we're looking at actual cost, it probably would have been that both of these started like up here, right? Where they have some positive intercept because there will be some cost associated with that, that first one. Yeah. It's very close to that idea. Uh, we probably won't start throwing that term out until next week. Um, but again, everything builds. So we're starting out. Yeah. Do you want to think about it as the equilibrium? I actually put up the module three reading yesterday. So if you take a look at that, um, you might start thinking about the allocated efficient point. Another term that we use really meaning the same thing is going to be that we're in equilibrium. It's not quite probably technically correct to call it, but it's for the sake of what we're doing, you can think of those two terms as synonymous right now. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. Also, don't let me forget, I think we'll have time at the end. I wanna show you something that I think will help with something that we did last class make a little bit more sense, but since we're still talking about this, I'm gonna kind of stay on this topic for right now. All right. Um, so at this point, how many of us are still having top hat issues? A handful of us. All right. Um, we'll just work through these problems together. Uh, I guess we'll kind of end up having fewer days uh, total. So I guess we'll end up, I originally I think I had it set up to be 20 of 24 days. It'll end up being what, 18 of 22 because I won't use them points since we're still having some people with issues. I'll try to get some solution over the weekend. Like I said, it'll probably be me. Maybe we won't be using Top Hat. And maybe I'll be converting those quizzes, questions over to Canvas. And we'll just, well, can you guys get on Canvas that aren't getting a Top Hat? You just don't have any Wi-Fi at all? Okay. That's that's great. Thank you, building manager. So um, I'll, I'll talk to someone and hopefully have something where we can maybe, maybe I'll ask them if they can install a Wi-Fi amplifier or something in this room so that we can kind of start use those, using those moving forward. Um, otherwise, we may have a very drastic change in, in how I want to give you guys those participation points. Um, other than that, like I said, I'm, I, I don't know why I emailed them. They convinced me that they were going to have the Wi-Fi better in this room, but apparently they, they lied. Um, okay. So I'm not using them for points since obviously not all of you can get on, but we'll just kind of walk through, assuming that we get this working for next week. So you could see a question, like this is like a possible quiz question. So anytime I have these top hat questions, even if we're not using them for points this week, they're good ones to go back and be able to review. Might be other than the practice problems, ones you want to work through before you take the quiz. So let's say I've got nuclear and coal power, coal power, there's a technology advancement that only impacts nuclear power, but not coal. If nuclear power is on the x-axis, which of uh, what happens to our production possibilities curve? Right? So in problems like this, I will tell you what good to put on the x-axis so that the answers make sense, right? Because depending on which one putting the x-axis, we saw that that like, shift could look different. Now, if I have a technology change that only impacts one type of power here, right? Am I going to see a shift out? No, right? We said we need, in order to see this kind of parallel shift out, we need a technology change that's going to impact both goods. Is everything going to remain the same? That one hopefully is an easy one to rule out. Like we have a technology change. If we're only producing the good that had that technology change, nuclear power, we should be able to get more of that, right? So there's going to be some change in our production possibilities curve. So from here, what would we do? Well, really just work through an example that was exactly like this. We're just putting names to the goods now, right? So I told you to put nuclear power on the x-axis, coal power here. I'll just draw some initial production possibilities curve that kind of has this bowed out shape, right? Reflecting that as I produce more of the x-axis goods, my costs are increasing. If I now have this technology change where I can produce more nuclear power, if that's all I'm producing, but doesn't impact Coal power production at all, 
what's going to end up happening. I'm going to kind of have this right word as my right word shift and try this kick out. Or I think the way that the, the answers were phrased, does it become flatter or steep, steeper? Yeah, so it's kind of maybe hard to see if you're just looking at this, but you can, one way that you can help kind of give yourself a nice visual, choose one quantity of that X good, and then try to draw a line that like kind of hits what that slope of your production possibilities curve was. Do the exact same thing up here. And then hopefully you kind of can create a visual for yourself if it's not clear to see that this is becoming flatter, right? You almost think about those, if it's moving out, right? You kind of take your hand, it's becoming flatter. So there we have a technology change in the x-axis good. Our production possibilities curve is going to become a little bit flatter. Now it is going to kind of shift out a little bit. So probably I, if I was using this as a quiz question and we weren't going to talk through it in class, when I said it shifts out, I probably would label that as a parallel shift out, right? Where we're kind of seeing it shift at every single point. Here we're seeing it shift in a way that just makes it flatter. Or does what to my cost for nuclear power? Decreases now, right? So I don't know. This is, you know, just another example of different, different goods that we can think about. How do we see these change in our production possibilities curve? Okay. Any questions on that? Yeah. Like blank paper? Yeah. 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 And you can write on the exam. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Also, yeah, that's actually a good question. Um, I'll maybe make, make a point, not just for the exams, but for the quizzes, especially after this first module. Uh, Definitely uh, the next couple models we work through. Probably every question, not every single one, but almost all questions, you can probably draw something to kind of help you visualize and kind of avoid easy mistakes. Um, you should be doing a lot of drawing as you're working on problems for this class. Okay. All right. So then the next one. So start question. So we have a technology improvement, investing in the same. Oh. We haven't covered this one yet. Hold on. <laughs> we'll come back to this. We'll close this out and I'll come back to it. So with this in mind, right? Uh, how do we get what we call kind of economic growth, right? So I kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, but we want to invest, you invest into things like human capital because you believe that's going to increase your production. If you can increase your production, what do you think a company is willing to do? Pay you more money, right? So... We kind of have this trade-off, not just at the individual level, you can think of it if you want to, but at the economy level, we're thinking about how much money is our economy investing into what we call capital and consumption goods. So capital goods are going to be things like we're investing for production in the future, consumption, we're producing these goods, they're gone tomorrow. Easy way to think about consumption goods, probably the easiest one to think is like food, right? If we produce food, it has to be consumed in a relatively, you know, I guess not technically today, but like within the year, and I hope, you know, I know there's food products with shelf lives more than a year. I don't trust any of them. Um, you know, if we produce something like this in terms of food, we should be consuming it relatively quickly. Whereas if I invest into something like education, human capital, it's gonna be around for a very long time, right? And I'm actually maybe not gonna see the increases in productivity from that investment until later on. But if I do make this investment, let's think about what we have going on here. So. So we're going to do exactly what we were doing before. Kind of thinking about, um, here's my capital. Here's my, I'm going to leave myself enough room. Here's my consumption goods. So as an economy, we have kind of this trade-off. How much do I invest into each one? Well, it's going to be the same idea. I initially start getting rid of consumption goods that my society doesn't find very valuable or resources I was putting towards consumption goods that were really highly, highly costly. And so then the cost of producing, or sorry, producing, investing in human capital right, is going to be relatively low. Now, as I invest more and more into capital, right, at some point the cost becomes very high because if I no longer have any consumption goods, my people are starving, right? Or they don't have anything that makes their life enjoyable right now, right? We don't have any, you know, iPhones, laptops, anything. So there's going to always be this trade-off between the investment in the capital goods 
and the investment in the consumption goods. So just like we were doing before, and we drew this a little bit too big. Okay. I could take the slope of this production possibility curve, this trade-off between consumption and capital goods, and I could come up with some increasing marginal costs. Okay. So it's really everything we've already done, just kind of put in a different context, right? The two goods we're thinking about, it's not no longer what are we putting our resources towards. It's like, what are we putting our resources towards? Um, and this is kind of almost more like investment, right? So we're not, not technically producing anything, but these are our investments that hopefully will pay off down the road, right? If I'm making investments in the capital today, what's likely to happen to my production possibilities curve in the future? If it's causing new technology improvements, I should get this shipped out, right? And then I have all these points that were unattainable before that I now can get to. So we're going to have this trade-off, right? This would tell us the marginal costs. We're then going to think about, okay, what are the marginal benefits to investing in the capital? Like I said, you can think of this as investing into, you know, um, I don't know, like even investing in the government, investing in different projects to come up with... Uh, New vaccines or you know new technologies. Uh, the, the military can come up with things like nuclear power, things like that. Or if it's easier to think about, human capital is also another investment that's pretty uh, uh, close to all of you, right? You're, you're all investing into it. Yeah. Well, so I, I, this, to the kind of point here, tech, like if you think about it, the very first, there's the very first investment you make in human capital is going to cost you something. So it's likely that the intercept would, I'm, and that shouldn't uh, impact any of the questions or any of the things that we're working through. But if we want to be technical, yeah, it probably does start a little bit above here, right? Another question. Yeah. So human capital is good, but you can think, like I said, um, any amount of money that we're dumping into research. For a company, even if we don't do it at the country level, you can think about a company having a production possibility curve, and they're taking resources that maybe they're not putting towards producing their product that they can then sell to make a profit. Some of the money they have goes into research and development. You know, and if that research, I mean, they're hoping that that money, it's not currently producing anything. Like it doesn't give them any new goods right now. What are they hoping for when they put money into research and development? That it in the future allows them to produce more goods, right? So research and development at the co company level is a good one to think about. Like I said, uh, you know, the government investing a lot of money into different military projects to come up with things that keep us safe, right? Um, we can hopefully produce more defensive weapons in the future, dumping money into different organizations like the NIH or the CDC, come up with new things that will hopefully allow us to produce better health products or more health products in the future, vaccines, whatever your, your things you would think about. Um, are all kind of examples there of capital goods. Any other questions before we keep going here? So, oh, there you go. Um, so how do we, you know, this investment in capital, how is it gonna cause this PPC to shift out? And we talked about the marginal cost, but what about the marginal benefits, right? So we can kind of think about the output in the economy is gonna be a function of a bunch of different things. You know, we talk about all these different factors of, of, of production. I think that was one of the things that they asked in one of the questions in the module. So all these different factors of production go into how much we can produce in our economy. Right? So you could really, you know, I have four categories here. They make them, this is generally the ones that we kind of start out thinking about. So capital, so this is once again, the investments we make into new technology, machinery, things like that. Labor, almost everything requires some kind of, you know, kind of labor hours put into it to, to get the production. Natural resources, or I, I don't know, I tend to, for some reason, sometimes we'll try to go back and forth between terms, but I know the book uses some, I have my own collo colloquialisms. I typically call natural resources raw materials. I just think, you know, that's easier for me to think about, like iron, wood, things like that. And then we have obviously human capital, um, is, is just, you know, just delineating that capital category. We really could make a ton of these, right? I could divide labor, and we often do, like if you continue to go into economics, you end up dividing labor into you what we call like skilled and unskilled labor, right? Because they get very different wages, right? So we want to treat them to have very different kind of impacts on how much output we can get, right? 
So we could we could make this a lot more categories. We'll just start out thinking about these four. And then output in our economy is going to be some function of these things. Now, A is going to represent all the available technology to us right now. So when we're making capital investments today, it doesn't impact the technology that exists today, right? I mean, you know, maybe there's like a, an example where hour one of the day, maybe at hour 24, there's some new technology. But I, I can't think of anywhere you could implement it within a 24 hour period, right? So if we think about A, there's going to be the current level of technology. We're hoping that our investments in capital lead to future increases in A, future increases in technology, because then putting in the same amount of resources. So this function, you know, think about like if you had a function which was y is equal to um, two times x. You put something in for x, you put the value three, two times three, the output you get is six. So we're putting in the same numbers of this function, we'll get the same value back, but now it gets multiplied by a larger value. We're gonna, using the same resources, get more output. We like that, right? We're, we're spending the same amount of resources to get now even more output. Yeah. So for the sake of what we're using guys, I'm sure like in some of your business uh, classes, they might use cash a little bit differently, like in a finance kind of class. But what we're talking about is think of it as investment into anything that could make your production process more efficient. So machinery, um, you know, like I said, research and development, all, all like anything that really isn't going to be your workers or your raw materials, right? It's usually going to be things that uh, workers are using to take the raw materials to make so that make a little yeah. yeah, that's a little bit more of a lame and I was not you know the most but yeah you can think of it that way right capital is going to be something that um, the laborers use to take the natural resources to make it possible. Yep. That's a good question. Any other questions before we keep moving here? Okay. So where are we at in time? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so we can kind of think about here. We got to keep moving this thing around. I wish it it's supposed to like go away. There we go. Um, so down here, if I move everything out of the way, we've got the amount of money that we're investing into capital. And here I just kind of thought of this as the amount we're investing per work. <laughs> so once we start looking at this, it does matter if we're investing the same amount of money, but we have more people in our economy, it's not going to have the same effect. So here we're thinking about, here's the amount of capital I'm investing per worker or per hour worked. Right? However, I'm measuring my labor. So Initially, if I don't put any investment into capital, what's going to be the output I get per worker? Well, if I don't give my workers anything to, to the point, if I don't give them anything to take the natural resources to make a good, I get nothing, right? So then as I start to invest, I start to give my workers some machinery. So maybe if I'm thinking about like, I want to, how many houses can I get my population to build? Well, they've got all the lumber laying around, but if they don't have a hammer, they don't have, you know, uh, any, 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 uh, uh, skill saws, they don't have you know any nail guns. This is, uh, I can't make a house just if you give me the, the lumber and the nails. Like I can't really use my hand. I need some tools, I need some capital, right? So then as I start to invest in the capital and give my workers more of these things, well, they can start to produce more and more houses, right? And if initially I had a hundred workers, but I only give them one nail gun, that's not gonna be near as efficient as I give those hundred workers 20 nail guns, right? So as I invest initially, you know, giving them that first nail gun, they can, uh, here it's, you know, say the nail gun costs, I don't know, $100, right? That first $100, notice what was my change in output here? I was getting about 500. So just like we did marginal cost, we can find the marginal benefit or here, what was the change, you know, the benefit being the additional output. So what was the additional output I got here for the first $100 I invested? Well, my change in Y would have been zero to 500, so 500, divided by my change in X, which was 100. So kind of my marginal output per worker or the marginal benefit here was I was getting five additional units per worker. Now, what if I invest the next $100? So same amount of money invested, 
It's the same idea as, as we're thinking about as I buy more of something, that marginal benefit we said was declining. So the first $100 I invested, I bought the tools that my workers needed the most to start thrifting these homes. Well, you know, maybe I can just make a dumb account. Maybe I throw it because I gave them handies, right? And I thought, oh, well, now I'm going to give you an answer. I'm going to invest another $100. Well, now it's even more efficient. So here, the next $100 spent, I'm going from $500 to about $900. If I'm kind of eyeballing this on the graph. So going from $500 to $900, that's my change in Y. So that's what, $400? And then what was my change in X? $100, going from $100 to $200. So 400 over 100. Well, now my marginal output or the marginal benefit to my economy was only getting four units per worker. And then you can kind of see what's happening to the slope of this production possibilities curve. It's becoming flatter, telling me that the marginal benefits are getting smaller or less. So here we can kind of analyze this relationship between the amount of capital invested. Where do we invest the capital first? Where it's going to be the most efficient or the most productive. Then if I still have money laying around, okay, now I'm going to put it into something more. So initially, maybe I want to you know, start creating something. The first amount of capital I put is probably to just get a building, right? Having a space where my workers can create this product. And then, you know, maybe I get them, uh, you know, computers. Maybe I'm like a financial company and you know, my output looks a little bit weird there, but it's like clients serve or something like that. Well, now that they have computers to work on, right, they, we can start processing even more. And then, you know, well, the happier my workers are, the more comfortable they are. Maybe I start to put some amenities in my, my office. But as I spend more and more money, each one of those things, like, yes, my workers, they're in more comfortable environments. They have, like, a, it's a, you know, maybe it's a, a streamlined uh, the production process in terms of, like, where they're moving. Yes, they can be more productive, but that wasn't near as productive as first having that space to actually work in or having that computer to work on. So as we invest more and more in capital, we just start investing. You know, we invest first in what was the most efficient. Then the next most, then the next most, then the next most. So our marginal benefit of each additional, in this example, hundred dollars spent, starts to decline. Same idea as declining marginal benefit. It's just now here the benefit is to our economy, which is the total output per worker. Let me see what I have here. Oops. Uh, yeah. So I did leave a slide open here. I thought I probably did because I want to go back. When we were talking about our investment into capital goods, we found the marginal costs before. You could kind of think about doing a very similar thing. So we have our quantity uh, of capital investment. And I was putting this in terms of per worker. I'm just going to kind of abbreviate it. We're just thinking about investments into capital, but I want to go back to that. When you think about the amount of investment of capital per worker, uh, and then this was kind of our production or our output per worker that we were getting. So we just said that initially, that first amount I invest in the capital gets me a lot, but then it starts to decline, right? So what's happening, if I then wanted to kind of think about the dollar value of, of these, these products, as I invest more in the capital, what's happening to my marginal benefit? Yeah, so, I'm going to have this diminishing marginal benefit. I had the quantity of capital over here. I could really plot these on the same graph so I can get this marginal cost. And just like we could find kind of the allocative efficient um, combination of two goods that the economy was producing, I can find the allocative efficient quantity of investment in the capital. Right? It's the same idea, just applied to a different problem. Right? Instead of two goods, now we've got kind of, we can invest in the consumption goods or we can invest into capital goods. But it's the same idea. There's a trade off between the two. I have the limited resources of how much I'm investing into each one of those types of goods, but there will end up being an allocated efficient point here. Okay. Questions on this idea? Yeah. What is the allocated efficient point? Sorry, I might have misspoke. Um, but it would be like, this is the allocated efficient point for the amount that we should invest in the capital. What are the questions here? All right. So we are getting 
we're in a very good place to save us some time to do some things that I think will be helpful. So um, just kind of like we had shifts in our economy, why just put out some possibilities for this like macroeconomic, what we call it. It's, I think the book calls it the macroeconomic production possibilities curve, but it's really this, how much should we be investing in the capital versus consumption goods problem? Well, we said if I invest in the capital, hopefully later on, right? So initially, I face this macroeconomic production possibilities curve. How much money should I be investing in the capital? The desire is as we invest in the capital, into machinery, into research and development, all these things that will hopefully lead to technology investments down the road. Well, if I can get these technology improvements, what's going to happen? We said A, in our production function, will increase, right? This kind of multiplier, I can use the same resources, but get even more output right, with this new technology. So, you know, chat GPT comes along using the same amount of, you know, investing the same amount of capital, labor, natural resources, everything. Now, th those same levels of capital investment, I'm going to get a higher level of output per worker. So it's going to look something like this. At every single amount of capital invested, because I have this multiplier, this new technology that's increased in my production function, I'm going to get a higher point at every single amount, amount of capital investment. Now, we kind of also notice what's happening to my slope here. I've got kind of a weird kink here. I must have actually entered in a wrong number, but kind of notice if I'm looking at the same amount of investment in the capital, it's kind of hard to see, but like, it looks like maybe I'm getting a little bit steeper of a slope, right? It maybe makes, maybe you can see it a little bit more like right here. Here would be my slope versus here's my slope. So when we make these investments in the capital, we kind of get this increase in our macroeconomic production possibilities curve. Which what we're really doing also is saying, well, now if I keep, investing that exact same amount into capital, I'm now gonna get a higher, more steep slope. So I'm getting even more additional marginal benefit or more additional output, right? So that investing that same amount in capital, once we get those technology improvements, now that capital investment is even more productive down the road. Um, so kind of similar, we could, Diving, I don't think we have the time. I'm also not going to ask you about questions on it, but a very similar thing would happen. Remember when we were walking through the beginning of class where I said if we have shifts out in our kind of production possibilities curve, that it shifted the marginal cost down when we had the change in slope? Well, here, this is changing the slope, but not for the marginal cost. It's changing it for the marginal benefit. So I'm saying the slope is a little bit steeper, marginal benefits are higher. You'd actually be shifting that marginal benefit curve, um, and you could get a similar thing where the allocated efficient point is going to change. We'll talk a lot more about those kind of equilibrium allocated efficient point changes next week. Yeah. What is the F? So F is just saying there's some function that exists. So it could be K plus L plus N plus H. It could be K squared plus L divided by two, but it could be L times N times H to the Q, right? Or H cubed, right? We don't know, you know, you, you get an idea of what the function is from data. But for the sake of this class, we don't know, we don't care what the actual function is. We just know if we put in these out, um, factors of production, we're gonna get some level of output. So it's just representing there's some function behind the scenes. We don't know what it is. If we put these, uh, back, you know, if we put money towards these different factors of production, here's the output we get. And then based off of that output, that's gonna get amplified. Those same investments into every single one of those categories that number will get amplified by the level of technology. Does that help make more sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, yeah. On the first. So, so if we're not comparing the two, what's happening to this red curve? As we invest more, the curve is getting ladder. So we would still have declining marginal output or declining marginal benefit. It's just going to be, it's, so it's still declining, but it's going to be like shifted. Any other question? Like I said, I won't kind of go into, you make you do those shifts on, on that, that graph, but I, I just felt worth mentioning, especially kind of leading us up into some stuff we'll talk about next week. Um, so I do have kind of a, a very simple kind of equation that you might have to use on this week's quiz. Wait, um, 
which is really to kind of highlight, highlight why we make these investments in the capital and how much impact they can actually have. So if we ever want to know kind of what um, the, you know, the product of our investment is going to be, if we can get some level of growth in our economy, and you can think about this, it's also synonymous with if you invest into something, so you put money into the stock market, right? there's going to be some growth rate that you can expect. So if we can get some level of, a, of growth in our economy by investing in the capital, if I take one plus that growth rate, and the growth rate we generally kind of put in decimal form. So if you want to take a growth rate of 5%, 0.05. Growth rate of 20%, 0.2. So this growth rate is always going to be in decimal form. So you take one plus that growth rate to the power of however many years you're wanting to know how much is this investment going to pay out, right? So you take your original GDP, multiply that by one plus your kind of expected economic growth rate to whatever power you're trying to project what your new GDP will be in, say, 10 years. So if I have a 5% growth rate, my current kind of GDP is $100. I know that's stupid, but 100 just to make it kind of easy. And then I'm willing to project 10 years out. I would have 100 times 1.05, right? 5%. 0 0.05 in decimal form, and then take that 1.05 to the power of 10, and then multiply it by that value of 100. That would tell me what my new GDP would be in 10 years at that current growth rate. Okay. So there's a general rule of thumb, which is that how long does it take for something to double? Um, you know, 70 divided by whatever the growth rate is. So if the growth rate is, uh, let's do some easy numbers, 7%. How many years would it take for my, my money to, to double? 10 years, right? 70 over seven, 10. If I can get even higher growth rates, right? So if I think about something like, um, what if I can get the growth rate to be 14? 70 over 14, it only takes me five years. Wait, did I do the math in my head right? 14, 50, 20, yeah, I get math. Second guess. So, you know, if I can get that growth rate to double, I can double my money in half as much time. So I want to kind of show you the power of this. I created a link here. Um, I also am pretty sure. Uh, and we'll come back to this question here in a second of time. So I want to go to Canvas, go to the home page. I think I put it up there so that if you want to open it up, you can. Although apparently some of us are having can't can't get it to. So yeah, I put the Excel file there. Your internet's not working. Maybe after class, you can take a look at it. Yeah. So there, I was using my growth rate was in percentage form, right? So 7%, it would be 70 over 7. Yep. The formula, the actual formula you'll use is kind of in decimal form. Yep. So if I go open up this Excel file, just to kind of show you, Real easy first, just keep it at, let's say I invest a dollar, right? So we can set this up in terms of like my country is investing a dollar into capital. What is the, you know, what is my GDP going to be 10 years down the road? So the way I have this set up is here's the different number of years. So I went 35 years out. Here's the different kind of interest rates. So this would be what? 2% economic growth, 4%, 6%, 8%, 10%, so on. I'm then not going to expect you to know any, we're not using, you're not going to have to use Excel in this class, but I'm just, I think this is kind of an interesting example. I basically just put that function in there, right? Take the original amount invested or my original GDP, multiply that by one plus this growth rate to the power of however many years. And I did some fancy stuff in Excel so that when I copy this over, it's saying, okay, take that amount invested, multiply it by one plus this growth rate to the power of this many years. Okay. So it's kind of, you know, you can see if I invested a dollar today and I could get a 10% return, in 10 years, I've got $2.6. You're like, oh, it's only $1.60. Yeah, but guess what? GDPs are like that, right? So, you know, we're going from, at a, you know, we could get economic growth of 10%. We're going from some crazy 11, whatever, like doubling the size of our economy in eight years. That's it's huge. So I put this in the context of, I want to go back here. There we go. $1, just because it's a little bit easier to look at these values. But I also want to make this connection 
I want this class to be like useful to your life. And although I'm sure you do care about the GDP, uh, you probably care a lot more about your own money, right? Well, this same equation and this same rule would apply to if you invested into the stock market, right? So, um, you know, if you invested a dollar and you can get a 10% return, you can double your money in about, right, somewhere in between about seven or eight years, right? So if you invest a thousand, seven or eight years down the road, you have $2,000. Now, I think right now, um, I was blown away. Some banks are offering CDs, which are like 5%, which is a pretty good growth rate. Um, so, you know, you could change this, be 0 0.05. If you invested, I don't know, $1,000 at the beginning of college, you get done in four, you'll have made $215. Okay? Now, I don't know if they're a four-year CD, but, but that would be the general idea. Now, I want to point out also here, I have another file on Canvas, which is S&P returns. This is just a PDF that I wanted to kind of show. I think this is by, well, it doesn't matter if it's by, but you can grab these numbers from a lot of different places. Um, just looking at the S&P 500, which if you're not aware, you're all Kelly students, so I think a lot of you, this might be more talk in your language, right? These are going to be the kind of the major companies um, and then, you know, kind of what the returns to investment in mutual funds that are tied to the S&P 500. So if you look across from 1937, which kind of includes, I mean, you're getting the Great Depression there. So if we kick that out, the numbers look even better. Um, but in general, like there are swings to our economy. But if you take any, where does it say this? Any 10-year time frame, the average return was like 13%, right? So I always tell people, like, if you want to invest in the stock market, it's a really high return. It's just that if you've got to take the money out, like you get in a pinch and you had to take your money out in 2009, well, yeah, then you're not going to get a 10% return, right? But if you can kind of hold on and you're just waiting for when that market is at its peak, any 10-year time period, if you make an investment, you can expect on average about 13% return. It's, it's huge, right? Um, like I said, 5% CDs is a good deal right now. But if you invest in kind of some, some mutual funds tied to the S&P 500, You'll be doing pretty good, right? And you play around with that, you know, table at 13%, invest $1,000, say you make $600 by the time you're done with college here, right? Or, or whatever it is. Um, so, I don't know. Hopefully that's somewhat interesting to, to some more business, some business minded people. Yeah. The old GDP, right? That old GDP is like your investment, and then that new GDP is like what your final payout would be as if you invest in the stock market. So investing your money in the stock market in the context of our economy, investing that money in the capital. Yep. Any other questions here? Okay. I think do I have any other things on the slides? Um, yeah, so don't underestimate you know the power of compound interest. Even relatively low interest rates, if you, know, if you hold on to it for 10 years, you increase the amount pretty quickly. Right? I can double pretty quickly. So the, the, the rule of 70, right? If I can get a 7% return in 10 years, I can double my money, right? Um, I also think we had a question that we're going back a little bit here, but just to kind of make the, the point, I just want to you know, work through it since we have the time. If I have a technology improvement, if I inv invest the same amount in my capital per worker, Am I going to see an increase, a decrease, or no change in that um, output that I'm getting per worker? Well, that was kind of going back to, we already hit on this, but if I'm investing the same amount in the capital and I get this technology change, what's happening to the marginal output that I'm getting? Up. Yeah, so we get a steeper slope, higher value. So as I kind of get these technology changes, investing the same amount in the capital, I'm getting an increase in the overall output I'm getting per work. So that's all that question was getting at. I kind of already hit on that when we were going over the material, because I know that I couldn't really use it for, for a top heck question in terms of points here today, since we're still having some Wi-Fi issues. Okay. Any other questions here? Okay. So I wanted to save us some time because I also wanted to show you. You can click on this packback link in Canvas. You go to questions, hopefully 
The first one should show up now. Now, I, they've integrated this into Canvas. This is the first year, which is why I would suggest maybe don't use it on the Canvas interface. Go to that packback.co and kind of sign in that way and like use it in a separate web browser. I'm sure that they've tried to work out all of the kind of kinks, but there still might be some stuff since they've just been great in the game. So, you know, I would, I would just suggest for right now to work in a separate web browser. So once you go to questions and you click on this first pack back assignment, you'll see I have it set to be due at the end of the day next Friday. We have a little bit more than a week to work on this. I don't want it to kind of overlap too much with next week's module reading and quiz. So I have it kind of set to be due at the end of the day next Friday. It should be relatively easy. So I've got kind of my initial guidepost, right? And I've got kind of my little spiel here. It's talking about, I give you a couple different articles, right? So if you're having issues with the links. I checked them yesterday and they should be working, but they're different articles related to chat, GPT, and productivity. Are we going to get counted off if we went to get the top hat? No, no, I said, we're, since I know people are having issues, I'm not using the points today. So we've got two articles that I really want you to focus on. I threw in this third one. I'm not expecting you to really go through this. This is like an academic article, so it's from MIT. But if you wanted to read the summary, it might give you kind of more context. But these other two were written for more mainstream out, um, outlets, and so they're going to be digestible for you. So read those two articles. I kind of provide like a small like summary and then I pose some questions like, you know, chat GPT could wor change worker productivity. What must these companies believe about their per, out, uh, per worker output in order to make such large investments in these, these technologies like chat GPT? So it's kind of related to the material that we've been talking about this week, just put in a very specific context. Um, the second article, I kind of do a similar thing. And along the way, I kind of pose some questions to just get you thinking about the topic now, what you're supposed to do is then make a response to what they call this guidepost. Okay? So you'll read those, then skim those, or don't not look into the fine tooth comb, although they're kind of interesting. Kind of read through those articles, read my kind of little paragraphs associated with that, then come up with a response to that idea, right? To this topic and the different things that I've said and the different things in the articles. Kind of your thoughts about this chat GPT, worker productivity. Um, even with uh, you know benefits to the different consumers, something related to this this topic, right? And, and what's being discussed. After you post your response, that's worth half the points. I believe it's ten points. Now you will have this AI kind of measure, which is they call it a curiosity score. I've got it set to be sixty. It really is just making sure you're you're not saying uh, I went to class today. This is a great you know topic. Like it's making sure that there's some thoughtful response that's related to my guidepost. Right? So it looks at the material in the guidepost, looks at your response, and you kind of tell, are you actually thinking about this issue or are you writing nonsense? Uh, it's not that difficult if you put any amount of effort into this to get above that curiosity score. After you do that initial response, and this is the part that you're kind of relying on your classmates to be up, uh, up on things, you need to then respond to two other people's responses or comment on two other people's responses. Now, obviously you can't do that until other people start responding to my guidepost. So it helps all of us if we all start responding to that guidepost early on, so that we can then start kind of adding this comment on each other's responses. Okay. Any questions on that? Yeah. Well, I can see and read the articles, but it doesn't let me reply to the array. Where do we write our So if you go back, uh we go here oh. where's the option at? yeah you oh mine's mine's gonna look different than yours um so when, so let me see yours right here yeah so when you open it up put it on top of the assignment it should give you yeah, your, your interface is gonna look hold on, we're not quite done with class. I've still got something I want to go over. So if you scroll scroll down. Yeah, my mine won't look the same as your guys. Class isn't over. I still have some stuff I want to go through. So just give me a little bit, a little bit of quietness, okay? 
So your interface looks a little bit different than mine, but if you scroll down past the post, there should be a, like a big blue box um, where it says like submit response or, or, or something like that. If you're having issues with it, you know, I can kind of walk you through it here after, uh, after class. Um, so that'll be due at the end of the day next Friday. Um, if you're having any kind of issues with it, let me know. I can still see not all of you are registered. So make sure you're getting registered for that so you can actually get the assignment done. Um, I'll have that mod my module three reading is up there and now available on Canvas. So if we go back here, I'll get the quiz posted up here on Canvas as well at 4.30 once my other section is done. So I'll have until the end of the day Monday to complete those. Um, I want to show you one more thing that I think would be very helpful and make kind of line up with some of your thinking. It's going back to a topic that we talked about last class. I think it'll be very beneficial. So if you can give me just a couple minutes of your time. We get out maybe still a couple minutes early. So I want to go through this example. I'll use the same example that I did last class to make this easier. Oh, yeah. I didn't hit it hard enough, apparently. So uh, iPhones and aircraft parts, right? So we had 30, 10, 60, and 50. Right. So we talked about we can kind of put these on a graph, figure out the slope. That tells me the cost of my x-axis is good. Another way of doing this is I can actually think about if I want to find the cost of one aircraft part, how do I make this number a one? Divide by 30. So in order to not change the relative kind of size of these, if I divide this by 30 and I divide this by 30, I get two. If I were to graph this out and find the slope, I'll find that that slope was negative two, right? My cost was two iPhones. So I can do this for the other country as well, but let's say this country, I wanna find the cost of one iPhone. So then I need to make the iPhone value a one. How do I do that? Divide by 50. If I divided that by 50, I need to divide that by 50, not to change the ratio. Now I end up with here, what's the cost of one iPhone to India? One fifth of an aircraft part. If you go back to the problem or you wanted to rework it, draw the graph, that's the exact same slope you would find as well. So, might be an easier way for some of you to think about it. Uh, I kind of forgot that I, I didn't throw it in there last class, but I had some stop by during office hours yesterday. And, and I think some people just, just line them. It's a little bit easier for them to think about. Yeah. All right. Now you're free to go. Have a fun, safe weekend. I will see you guys on Tuesday.